Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the virtual conference on the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, this is uh, the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network um, organized conference in partnership um, with the Center for Human Rights um, in the within the context of Southern African um, region. Um, on this pertinent occasion that seeks to reflect on um, the protection of refugees, um, migrants, and um, various categories of forcibly displaced persons within the Southern um, African region, um, including IDPs as well as with stateless persons. And you're most welcome to our pertinent um, conference today. I do hope that you had enjoyed the first session, um, which was earlier moderated um, by Professor Franz Filiun and which um, included um, a representative from the UN Office uh, for the, of the High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, Ms. Dikongwe Atangana, um, Dr. Cristiano Dossi from uh, the University of Johannesburg and uh, Professor Christopher Chanwen Chimbi from uh, the University of Pretoria. Um, in this particular session, we will be speaking about um, local integration of refugees and really sort of reflecting on um, pertinent experiences uh, within the Southern African region, uh, discussing the challenges and the opportunities for the protection of refugees and asylum seekers um, within the Southern African region. And um, on this um, imperative and distinguished panel are three distinguished uh, speakers. We have um, our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Makaria Makobi from the University of Botswana, um, who has significantly done extensive work um, in relation to uh, the protection of refugees and asylum seekers. And it's really a, a privilege to have her here with us. Um, Dr. Elizabeth um, holds a bachelor's degree in, in law from the University of Botswana and a master's degree in international law from the University of Cambridge. Um, after se several years as a litigation attorney in private practice, as she joined the administration of justice as a magistrate and at teaching areas and research areas uh, broadly in, in, in the context of international law, but she's done extensive work, um, as Elliot said, around refugee protection, asylum seekers, and really uh, an absolute pleasure once more to really have a uh, be part of this uh, pertinent panel of experts. And she will be speaking to us about uh, the experience um, in Botswana. Um, following our presentation would have uh, Dr. Pedro Figueredo Neto from the University of Lisbon, um, who is an anthropologist, an architect, and a filmmaker, currently a research fellow at the Social Sciences Institute of the University of Lisbon, and a guest um, professor at Nova uh, University, and his research focus is on borders, migration, mobility, forced displacement, violence, extractivism, humanitarian regimes, and refugee camps, mainly in the African context. And he's also done extensive work. Um, and in fact, um, you, you're cordially invited to um, look at um, his web page, um, Pedro, um, pedrofneto.com for and follow up with some of the pertinent works he's, he's been doing in this area, really looking at that intersection uh, that is imperative for reflecting um, from a nuanced perspective around refugee protection, but of course sort of linking that back to notions and ideations that are integral to having a, a holistic understanding um, on the subject. And he will be speaking to us also very importantly around integration of refugees from Angola um, in Zambia. And our third um, speaker is Ms. Jessica K. Lawrence, um, who is an attorney with the Lawyers for Human Rights um, and also um, with the University of Johannesburg. Uh, and she will be speaking about the shrinking spaces for asylum and, and barriers to refugee protection in, in South Africa. Um, and um, Ms. Jessica is an attorney admitted attorney who is passionate about human rights and social justice, um, an eloquent speaker I must also add. Uh, she joined Lawyers for Human Rights in 2014 and is currently the head of LHRO's um, law clinic, Johannesburg Laws Clinic, um, which provides free legal advice and assistance to asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. And during her time at LHR, um, she has worked with vulnerable and marginalized communities on various issues, including access to water and environmental justice, um, and also the right to fair labor practices for labor broker workers. And in, in the recent past, um, Ms. Jessica has worked on a diverse number of issues, including strategic impact litigation, which seeks to address systemic issues within the asylum application system in South Africa. And really, um, from a very hands-on perspective, she brings on a significant um, 
understanding of, of the issues and, and reflect on this from both from the perspective of being a, a lawyer, um, but then also from being um, quite keen to the issues at the, on the ground, um, having had significant interactions both within the legal system and much more pragmatically as well um, from um, interacting with the population on the ground. So, and she will be speaking to us, as Elia said, on the stricter spaces for asylum and um, barriers to refugees protection in South Africa. So thank you very much. And um, once more, I seek to welcome our distinguished um, panel of experts who will be speaking to us today. Um, before um, giving the floor to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Makaria Makubi, I would just like to um, kindly um, state a few housekeeping rules. Um, please do kindly um, put your, your speaker, your, um, your microphone on mute so that we could hear our speakers. And should you have any questions, kindly put them on the, in the chat box and um, our speakers will be sure to interact with you. But more importantly, we'll be sure to ensure that your questions are answered um, after the presentations um, following the Follow the presentation, the final presentations we have, and of course, when once we open the floor for questions, we do expect to have um, to take these questions and also have you participate much more pragmatically. Um, our speakers will be showing us their PowerPoint presentations. Um, they will also be speaking to us um, with they would be speaking to us and would get to see them um, via. Uh, the, the live video. Uh, please do kindly try to make your questions quite succinct so that we could um, have them in the chat box and our speakers could pick them up quite easily and then we can also read them out um, once the time comes for questions. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Elizabeth uh, Makaria Makobi for our presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and hi. Um, my name is Dr. Liz, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Adiola. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here with you and to share the Botswana experience on uh, refugees. So if you just give me a moment now, I will uh, attempt to share my screen. Um, I think this is what I'm looking for. And... Um, we can get started. Um, Ade, would you just confirm that you have a good view of that? Yes, an excellent view. Thank you so much. Okay, very good. Let's see if we can go into slideshow mode. Uh, probably not. Okay, very good. So thanks very much again. And just to get started on a roadmap, I'll be discussing the international lay of the land with respect to Botswana, um, and then look into uh, just inform you a little bit about our national laws with respect to refugee protection, and then a little chat about the Botswana experience, and a little bit about UNHCR involvement also in refugee protection in Botswana. Um, so just to get started, Botswana is state party to the 1951 Refugee Convention, and we do have reservations to that convention, notably um, the reservation to the right to, uh, of movement uh, for refugees. And as we go along, you will see why that becomes important in the Botswana context. And we're also party to the EU Convention of Refugees of 1969, but of particular interest, of course, is that uh, Botswana has not ratified um, the Kampala Convention or the EU Convention on Protection and, um, and Assistance of, of IDPs. Um, with respect to national law, um, Botswana retains a very old statute. It's a 1968 statute. And actually what you could mention about this particular document is that it was enacted before uh, Botswana became state party to our international conventions. And therefore it does not speak at all to Botswana's international obligations under refugee uh, law, international refugee law, which is a sad state of affairs, of course, because you can imagine uh, the document is control oriented, um, a document developed uh, in the climate of a, a neighbor and apartheid South Africa at the time, um, and has nothing really to do with the international protection of refugees as we understand it now. So it's not at all protection oriented. And this is one of the greatest difficulties of refugee protection in Botswana, that the law really does not assist um, in the process of protection of refugees. Um, I'm now going to chat a little bit about the status determination procedure. Um, some of the things that I will comment about may surprise you in the international uh, framework. They might seem a little bit odd or um, 
maybe unbelievable even <laughs> that we still have a statue that looks like this. But um, just to take you a little bit through, um, in terms of our uh, Refugee Act, an asylum seeker will present themselves um, usually at an immigration uh, checkpoint or um, to a police officer and sometimes to the UNHCR and request protection. And at this point is when an official interview would be arranged. Um, what happens to the asylum seeker pending the uh, interview? What happens to the asylum seeker is that they would be detained during this time, uh, pending the hearing of their matter uh, by what we call the Refugee Advisory Committee. And typically they will be placed at what we call the Center for Illegal Immigrants in uh, Francistown, um, waiting uh, for the hearing. Um, the hearing is then uh, conducted by the Refugee Advisory Committee. And um, when the hearing is uh, conducted, the individual will not have any access to case preparation facilities. So you can imagine the person is in detention, they've not had access to any opportunity to prepare their case or what it is they're going to say. And very interestingly as well, there's, there's no set of rules that accompanies the Refugee Act uh, providing for any procedural safeguards as you would expect um, for an individual who is uh, going to appear before the Refugee Advisory Committee. Um, of course, this is a challenge because in terms of our constitution, all these law, all these uh, safeguards are provided for and the rights of anyone appearing before any court are well protected. But when it comes to refugees, unfortunately, there is this gap. The other thing that is of interest with respect to our Refugee Advisory Committee colleagues is that the committee typically does not have representation from anybody particularly skilled in international law, international refugee law. Um, it's comprised of the district commissioner, um, police officers, uh, immigration officers, government officials essentially. And so without any particular training in refugee law or international law, you possibly would not expect that the advisory committee would be alive uh, to particular issues. Uh, of course, there is a, a safeguard with respect to that, if I can say that, because the UNHCR typically would sit as an ad hoc member of that committee. But what would you would expect as best practice would be that you would have a member of academia or someone trained in international law who would be able to advise on international law issues and refugee law issues uh, in such a committee. But unfortunately, we don't have that set up. Uh, typically, of course, these proceedings are not open to the public. Um, another area of concern, of course, is that uh, reasons for decisions are usually not furnished to the asylum seeker. So a decision will be taken and reported to the minister um, in charge of these matters and not uh, furnished to the asylum seeker. So the asylum seeker will receive a yes or no answer, but not accompanied by any reasons. Uh, further to that, there is no opportunity for appeal. So once the decision is taken, it's not possible for one to appeal to a further committee to have the decision reviewed over time. So the decision is taken and that, that is it. Um, there's also no opportunity for legal representation in terms of our Refugee Act uh, for any person, any asylum seeker seeking protection in Botswana. And um, again, another problem that we are having uh, in Botswana is that uh, there would be, in our experience, delays in removal of unsuccessful applicants who have um, not uh, received a positive response for their refugee uh, application. So we have two very uh, interesting cases, uh, Gezi and Iragi. And this particular case is concerned women who came into Botswana as asylum seekers with young children who went through the status determination process, were not successful, but then remained um, at the Center for Illegal Immigrants for extended periods of time until uh, such time as an application for habeas corpus was brought with respect to them um, and the minor children. And the judgments were handed down by the Court of Appeal, very interesting judgments. I've written um, a book chapter on that. Um, and um, the judgments uh, did not really advance refugee law. Uh, with respect to uh, these matters. Um, of course, some uh, steps were taken or suggested by the court as to how these matters, uh, how we could reduce uh, the amount of time that the individuals stay um, in Botswana pending or following 
um, a negative uh, response. But again, just to show that these matters become so serious that they end up um, in litigation. So these are challenges with our refugee um, advisory committee and the procedure for status determination. Um, I was asked um, when preparing for this to also mention the role of the UNHCR. So as I said, the role of the UNHCR is that we are ad hoc members of the Refugee Advisory Committee and would be able to give uh, comments uh, with respect to particular cases and typically would be to provide a country specific information with respect to the country of origin that has been mentioned by the asylum seeker. Of course, as is typical of many places, not just Botswana, asylum seekers sometimes do not give frank and honest information about the countries where they have come from. And this sometimes presents a challenge. Uh, in the Iraqi and Gezi cases that I just mentioned, this was the challenge. It was very difficult to pin down exactly where the two families had come from, and that presented a problem. Um, and then, of course, there has been the recommendation that there is a need upon review of this particular legislation to formalize the role of the UNHCR in relation to um, status determination um, in Botswana. Um, then protection for persons who have received a positive response and have been granted refugee status in Botswana. Um, I must say that in this particular area, there, there's more positives and there are negatives to comment on. Um, the encampment policy is still in effect in Botswana. As I mentioned, there's a restriction to the freedom of movement for refugees in the country. And refugees are kept at a camp we call Dukui Refugee Camp, which is 154 kilometers from uh, Francistown. Um, in the camp, education and health services are provided by government, uh, supported by uh, donors, donor organizations. Um, and um, the main challenge with respect to the camp uh, is a uh, restriction the right to movement with the attendant uh, uh, problems that you'd expect uh, to attach to that, which is a limitation in employment opportunities for, for, for refugees. Um, some challenges, of course, have been experienced with respect to um, return of uh, Namibian refugees in particular, um, which is a matter that has been ongoing for many, many, many years um, with respect to Namibian, re Namibian refugees in Botswana and has been the subject of some litigation. Um, lastly, I would just like to mention areas for law and policy reform uh, here in Botswana that can be identified. Uh, first of all, of course, there's a need to review our act really and bring it up to speed and make sure that it contains within it international protections for asylum seekers and refugees and takes cognizance of developments under international law. Secondly, there really is a need for targeted training of uh, officials who are dealing with refugees, whether these are police officers and border officials who typically would interact with, with refugees. Um, and also I would mention in that um, officers who are working at the Center for Illegal Immigrants because unfortunately there is a tendency to, to not make that differentiation between a person who's been detained for criminal uh, matters, whether on bail or whatever, or an, and a person who's actually an asylum seeker. And of course there is a complete distinction between the two. Then um, there's a need to legislate for assistance with um, case preparation and procedural matters and ensuring procedural safeguards for uh, persons applying for refugee status in Botswana uh, in the status determination hearing. Um, there is a great need to strengthen protection for asylum seeking children. I think for refugee children, uh, the problems would not be so um, severe at all because as I said, um, social services are available to them at the camp. But with respect to asylum seeking children, um, there is a challenge there uh, because it's sad to see the detention of children um, pending uh, the hearing of asylum cases. And then lastly, um, we need to reconsider reservations to the 1951 convention and in particular, uh, the right to movement. So thank you very much. That's a short presentation that I had for you today. I'm looking forward to listening to your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Adi. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Elizabeth Makaria Mukovi. Uh, that was a really um, insightful presentation. And it's interesting that you also mentioned the need, um, the importance of protecting asylum uh, seeker children as well. I think it also came up quite strongly in the, the first um, session of the day um, as being imperative in the furtherance of um, significant solutions within the Southern African context as well. Um, thank you for that uh, part in the presentation. And I'm sure that uh, there are 
probably questions that have come up in people's mind that would of course be asked um, at some point um, following the presentations um, that we have today. Thank you so much for that once more. Um, I'd not like to move on to Dr. Pedro uh, Figueredo um, Neto, um, who will be speaking about integration of refugees from Angola in Zambia. You have the floor, Dr. Pedro. Okay, let me, thank you, Romola. Let me just share my presentation. Can you see it correctly? Yeah? Yes, we can. Yes, thank okay. You. Let me just do full screen it. Okay. Well. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are located. I'd like to start by greeting the other speakers and those following us online. And of course, a uh, special thank to Romola for this very last minute yet surprising in invitation. As, as the title of my presentation suggests, I will be speaking about the local integration of Angolan former refugees living in and around the Meheba refugee camp. This is in Northwestern province, Zambia. And of course, also beyond local integration, uh, trying to also tackle the, some of the related challenges. I have to, to mention that also as an anthropology, ethnographic field work is central in my research. And uh, I have been studying the, this camp, this region with regular periods of field work since 2011 with Meheba as, as a central context of, of research of my PhD as well. So, um, however, the fact is that last time I was in Zambia, it was early 2018. This doesn't mean that I do not have access to other uh, more up-to-date information, but as I was saying, I tried to stick to first-hand information. Um, and we, of course, we know that while some of that is easily available, the reality on the ground is often more complex. So I shall start Wait a moment. So I shall start with a very brief historical spiral, which I find very helpful to provide the overall context and put some issues in, in perspective as well. So the struggle for independence in Angola starts in 61, but it only gains momentum in 66, when in 1966, when the Eastern Front is opened. And Zambia, which had attained independence two years before in 1964, supported regional liberation movements for it allowed the circulation of troops and the de deployment of military rare bases in its national territory. This opportunity was soon grabbed by the two main Angolan movements and political parties, UNITA and MPLA. And as hostilities escalated with MPLA and UNITA fighting each other and against the Portuguese colonial army, Angolan population started to flee across borders, namely to neighboring Zambia. So in the end of the 60s, many of the displaced populations in Zambia were being recruited by the two nationalist movements, UNITA and MPLA, as I've mentioned. And this led to the bombing of Zambia, territory by the Portuguese colonial forces, aimed at targeting the rebels, rebels here under inverted commas, of course, the rebels bases, which were also refugee areas. And as a result, the government of the Republic of Zambia produces the Refugee Control Act in 1970, which as the name suggests, and as Elizabeth also was discussing with regard to Botswana, was aimed essentially at better controlling and managing the displaced populations. So after the Control Act, all refugees entering in Zambia had to be registered and were required to live in camps or settlements. Um, it is in this context that the Meheba refugee camp is created in uh, 1971, located far from the border with Angola to avoid further bombings, uh, and, and ready, of course, to host uh, displaced Angolans. Um, let me just say that the Refugee Control Act of 1970 was repealed and replaced in 2017 by the Refugee Act Number no. 1, that foresees integration, assimilation, and the eventual granting of Zambian citizenship. I will get back to this further on. So the process of creation of Meheb and the enforcement of the Refugee Control Act of uh, 1970, uh, namely in the identification of supposedly refugees and their removal and forced transfer to camps raised many questions. 
not least because of the cultural and uh, ethnic proximity and similar way of life among many border peoples. So groups like the, the Luvali, Mbunda, Chokwe or Lodzi had seen their territories officially partitioned during the first decades of the 20th century in the aftermath of the Berlin um, Scramble for Africa, uh, Berlin Conference. And so people in this region were used to freely move between borders to avoid the harshness and abuse of British and Portuguese colonial hand, or sometimes even to restore the ecological balance. So still, this is, it is also true that the consolidation of this border was a gradual process to which Zambia and Angolan, Angolans, Angola's independence would largely contribute to. And I'd say also arguably that the Geneva Convention of uh, 1951 and the protocols that followed also played a role in the consolidation of that very border, which we have to consider once we look at phenomena such as uh, the, the quest for refuge or local integration. Uh, we can discuss this in detail uh, later on. There are a set of dynamics and issues that I could further elaborate, but I'd like to underline now that to a great extent, it was the creation and existence of refugee law that created Angolan refugees in the first, in the first, in the early stages, of course. As before, these would be considered simply migrating, migrating villages who happen to live near and or move along uh, a new African border. Before and indeed before the creation of the 1970s Refugee Control Act, most displaced populations arising from Angola were silently integrated along border villages, among kin, and in urban areas with government officials and local chiefs, um, turning a blind eye to their presence, even if this we know also sometimes resulted in, in abuses. Um, it is possible to say then that it was the entrance in the refugee camp and not necessarily the crossing into Zambian territory through a more or less invisible board to create and consolidate the idea of refugee, of refugees, with all the issues uh, such legal framing um, ended up posing. Well, moving forward, in 1975, Angola attains independence, but the hostilities would continue until 2002 with the assassination of UNITA's leader, Jonas Savimbi. And as violence unfolded and peace was announced in Angola, different waves of Angolan refugees and returnees echoed in the demographics of Zambia's refugee camps. Still, over time, the Meheb refugee settlement also came to host populations arising from the DRC, Rwanda, Burundi, Somalia, among others, which also maps the several regional conflicts. And this is very interesting because there's, and I, I'm not, it's not the scope of my, of my contribution here today, but I feel that there's a very differentiated treatment um, once we look at Angolans and other nationalities, but let's move on. So between 2001 and 2003, Meheb accounted with more than 50,000 refugees, of which roughly 90% were Angolans. Today, the camp hosts almost 20,000 individuals and extends, this is a huge camp of some 700 square uh, kilometers that is roughly the size of Singapore. This is really huge. Um, and this is due to the number of, of refugees, but also to its agricultural nature, as refugees are entitled to farmland and expected to attain self-sufficiency. So this is why often it's called a settlement and not necessarily a camp, although I'm using them interchangeably. Um, UNHCR data from August 2020 uh, points to more than 18,000 Angolan former refugees in Zambia considered of concern and of which some 6,000, that is a third roughly, still living in Meheba. But let me focus uh, closely on the integration process. 2012 marks the end of the refugee status uh, displaced for displaced Angolans and Rwandese. And of course this required uh, the implementation of durable solutions. Uh, coincidence or not, 2012 also marks the first presidential elections in Angola in times of peace. I was doing research in Mehebe in early 2012 and I realized that this sudden concern and strong pressure towards repatriation by MPLA's uh, government, of course, had also electoral aims. This was not only my, um, my feeling, but also something shared, widely shared by um, Angolans 
living in the camp. And later when I was conducting research in Angola, they also uh, underlined this, uh, this uh, same uh, perspective. Um, but from, from 2002 to 2012, many Angolans had returned to their country of origin, some spontaneously, meaning that they simply left the radar and many actually remained in Zambia or moved elsewhere. Um, and some returned under voluntary repatriation endeavors, although it has to be mentioned that contrary to what is sometimes announced by the UNHCR, the IOM, Zambia and Angolan uh, Angola's governments, repatriation was not always necessarily voluntary. Um, many families and individuals were repatriated because no other solution was offered and many wanted actually to remain and integrate in Zambia as they were already to some extent integrated. Moreover, the fact that they were repatriated, as I was saying, does not mean that most returnees have actually reintegrated in Angola and or that in the meantime, in spite of return, having, having returned to Angola, have not returned again to Zambia. Um, so let's focus on the very heterogeneous groups of Angolans in Meheba that resisted the several repatriation exercises and aimed at integration. In 2014, the state created the much welcome strategic framework for the local integration of former refugees in Zambia, which aimed to regularize the status of former Angolan refugees and also Rwandese. Um, among the criteria, criteria required to qualify for local integration under this uh, framework, uh, applicants had to fill at least one of the following conditions. Uh, be the children of citizens of Zambia, a child born from at least one Zambian parent was eligible to apply then, be married to Zambian uh, nationals, and uh, golden refugees married to Zambian spouses were eligible to apply for a spouse permit, um, be an investor, uh, be employed and provided that refugees had professional qualifications or due to long stay continuous residence. So former Angolans who had arrived in Zambia between 1966 and 1986 and had continuously lived in Zambia as well as their children were eligible to apply for a resident uh, permit. And after 10 years, they would be eligible to apply for citizenship. And finally, of course, in support of the principle of family unity, um, Angolans or refugees married to other re refugees of other nationalities could also apply, although on a case by case. Um, so we are talking about individuals who have lived most of their lives in Zambia, or that are the sons and grandsons or the daughters and granddaughters of Angolan refugees. And in sense to continue describing these populations as Angolans, I, say, I think makes little sense. Um, much like saying second, third generation refugees. So to speak about this individual in these terms reflects more a legal humanitarian labeling rather than necessarily a sociological framing. Um, moreover, Zambian approval of residence permits, permits was conditional on the former refugees obtaining Angolan passports. And many of my interlocutors were afraid of being set back to, sent, back, sent back to Angola as a result of registering in the Angolan consulate in Solwezi, which is the closest town uh, to Meheba. Um, in addition, those living in uh, urban areas or border villages were also afraid to be requested to move to camps or resettlement areas. So you can see how people were wary of, of this uh, welcoming but still uh, quite bureaucratic procedure. Um, as of now, there are still many issues concerning the implementation of the strategic framework for the local integration of 2014. So upon field work in 2018, I still could acknowledge that many Angolans were still awaiting for the processes to be closed and many were still awaiting for an Angolan passport on which depended, depended the eventual issuing of a residence permit. Um, moreover, as you can see from this map, as Meheba was split into areas, uh, actually three, but um, the Meheba town is something still in the horizon, not yet uh, being consolidated as such. 
um, it was split in two areas, one for refugees and another for local integration. So this meant that many former refugees, Angol, namely Angolans and Rwandese, had to abandon their houses and lands where they lived for decades in this camp and move to the more peripheral areas that were being devoted to local integration. So we are talking about areas uh, some 30 kilometers away from the main gate, most of which with few or virtual no infrastructure such as schools or clinics. Um, it also meant that these people are now under the umbrella of the UNDP and no longer under the mandate of the UNHCR. So in the local integration areas of Meheba, development is in the order of the day. So former refugees are encouraged to, to engage in agricultural production, essentially uh, monocrops, maize and soy, and resorting to genetic modified seeds, what puts in risk any perspective of sustainable development, and of course, also we could think about sustainable integration. Um, and it, last but not least, it is also important to mention that this is a mining region. So with Luana mine operations taking place in the immediate surroundings of this camp, you can check in Google Map uh, on Google Maps. These have been these have already compromised watercourses and aquifers, and uh, will certainly result in further displacement as these areas will be. Uh, hard to, to live in. Moreover, according to Zambia's mining flexi cadastre portal, and this is really uh, in incredible, the, the territories of Meheba, including the, of the local integration areas, have been concessed to large scale exploration licenses of copper, cobalt, and uranium. So we, we can see how, how durable and how sustainable will this local integration probably uh, be. To conclude, uh, there is no doubt that the Zambian government has grown more willing to grant freedom of movement to refugees, given residency rights to former refugees from Angola. In 2017, after years of drafts, negotiations with the NHCR and institutional blockages, Zambia's Refugee Act Number no. 1 was signed. This is a very progressive legislation. But the president, and, and the president, it has to be said that the president of the Republic of Zambia, Edgar Lungu, personally intervened to develop this new Refugee Act and even ignored ministerial department's demands concerning repatriation of, of refugees. During this time of refugee policy change, the state has also been moving towards more of an authoritarian style of governance. And we should be cautious with this hospital uh, refugee friendly approach as refugee as receiving large numbers of refugees also has the potential to make the international community turn a blind eye to attacks on basic human rights and to declines in democratic principles in the country and we don't know how this will eventually might spill also to 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 refugees so we'll need to see how these developments translate on the ground and how this might eventually affect refugees and former refugees so I'd like to thank you, and I would also kindly ask the support of Romola to help screening part of a film essay that I hope will provide a few more insights into this, into this region and into the, the topics that I brought here to, to the table. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pedro, for that um, pertinent um, and concise presentation. Uh, thank you for also um, sharing with us this pertinent video that we're about to watch. I'll just screen it as, as you've rightly um, indicated. Can you see my screen? Let's uh, see black screen only. Okay, that's fine. I, I'll begin to play it now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs>
a chegada atribui a enterrar a água no modo para a habitação. Construímos casas, cultivamos a terra. Uns vêm, outros vão. Alguns demoram-se aqui para sempre. Crescemos com expectativas. Enquanto estiveres no campo, podes ambicionar montar um pequeno negócio. Mas se fazes perto, levantas a uma igreja. Com alguma sorte, talvez encontres um trabalho numa das ONGs que ainda estão no campo. Fazer carvão é uma possibilidade, mesmo que um dia seja isso a obrigar-nos a partir. das situações, continuaremos a trabalhar a terra e a vender parte do que produzimos nos mercados do campo. Tantos até anos vamos até a cidade mais próxima, visitar parentes, tratar de burocracias ou comprar coisas que não existem no campo. Um dia o campo será uma cidade, o encerramento será a abertura. Para circular é necessário uma autorização de saída. Mas o portão já não é controlado e o campo nunca esteve vedado. Apenas a administração e as ONGs continuam a erguer vedações.
Entretenimento é o normal desfecho. Podemos ter nascido aqui, mas estaremos sempre de outro lugar. Vamos connosco o que temos. Cobertores, baldes, sementes, alguns parentes, esperança, óleo de girassol. Deixamos atrás comunidades, casas, as terras que cultivámos durante anos. Deixamos também os nossos mortos, anónimos. prometem desenvolvimento e boas colheitas. Mas estas sementes nunca serão nossas. Enquanto se abriam poços, as novas zonas foram encontradas pedras preciosas e metais novos. A água está contaminada e as chuvas são cada vez mais irregulares. As atividades extrativas colonizam novos territórios. Ou deixamos as nossas terras ou são elas que nos abandonam sem que nos movamos. Extrair e processar humanos e não humanos de igual modo. Começa a surgir. Enquanto outros procuram refúgio, outros refúgios desaparecem. 
Thank you, Dr. Petro, for that um, pertinent insight. Um, very much appreciated. Um, and now I'd like to would like to move on to Dr. Elizabeth. Um, would like to move on to Dr. Elizabeth Makaria Makobi, and we're moving on to her before we move on to Ms. Jessica Lawrence, um, because I do we do know that she has to leave us at around um, two fifteen. How she has another meeting at around two thirty, um, and, and as such, we'd just like to take one question that I think is particularly in the chat box for her, um, just in case um, we don't get to hear from her again. Um, so there's a question for you, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, um, and it's from Shiren Mukadam, um, a master's student at WITS um, African Center for Migration and Society. And the question here is that um, we'd like to know what protection the Botswana government extends to migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees in the context of COVID-19. Um, given the current lockdown and the prevalence of the pandemic. Um, Ms. Dr. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Hi, thank you, Shireen, for your question. I think it's a really topical question, given um, the situation we find ourselves in with COVID. I do not have an answer for you at the moment. My sincere apologies for that, but I would very much like to be able to respond to you. So if you would be able to share your email with me, then I'll be able to find out for you what uh, steps have been taken for protection. There's two areas I see here. The first one would be with asylum seekers, which uh, as you know, typically because our asylum Asylum seekers are under uh, are kept in, in facilities under the prison service, so I'll be able to answer that in that context. And then there's a question of refugees and what measures are being taken specifically in the camp. Thanks for the interesting question. I'm sorry I don't have an answer now, but I'll be happy to assist you outside of this forum. Thank you. You're on mute, Ade. Oh, sorry. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Elizabeth. Um, for that uh, part and insight. But please, Shireen, kindly also share your um, email as indicated in order to um, also be able to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And now we'd like to move on to um, Ms. Jessica K. Lawrence, um, who will be speaking about the shrinking spaces for asylum and barriers to refugee protection in South Africa. Ms. Jessica, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. Afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the Center for Human Rights uh, for inviting me and for the very generous introduction. I am just going to be sharing my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay. Great. So, as mentioned, I'm going to be discussing um, the state of refugee protection in South Africa, as well as focusing on the shrinking space for asylum and some of the barriers um, to refugee protection. I'm going to be looking at the asylum application system and its challenges in South Africa, as well as the refugee amendment. I think that it uh, will be useful if we locate today's discussion um, in the wider context of the Refugee Amendment Act, as well as the asylum system in South Africa, as well as um, South Africa's response to migration. Um, and this is to note that the new amendments to the Refugee um, Amendment to the Refugees Act has been taking place over the course of the past couple of years, and it, it forms part of a pattern of more restrictive approaches to movement. Distinct to uh, many other refugee receiving countries, South Africa has traditionally been a rights-based refugee country with rights-based legislation, historically allowing for refugees and asylum seekers to access a broad array of rights from healthcare services to education and employment. However, the new Refugee Amendment Act and new policies which we have been seeing implemented at the refugee reception offices are clear evidence of a more um, regressive and less generous policy direction, which is intended to shrink the space for asylum and further constrain the rights of asylum seekers and refugees in South Africa. This is just an overview of some of the restrictive policies which we have seen come into effect over the past couple of years. We have seen the closure of many refugee uh, reception offices, 
And these are the main points of contact where refugees and asylum seekers um, attend to interact with the Department of Home Affairs and also to lodge applications for asylum and renew documentation. The Refugee Amendment Act uh, was published in 2017. Then in 2020, the regulations to the Refugee Amendment Act were published, um, resulting in the Refugee Amendment Act coming to effect as of the 1st of January 2020. We saw the Border Management Authority Act come into effect last year, as well as the publishing of the Gauteng Township Economic Development Bill, which seeks to restrict economic activity quite severely for um, non-nationals. There is general consensus that the asylum application system in South Africa is incredibly strained and is failing to effectively and efficiently fulfill its function. Some of these challenges are resource constraints, severe staff capacity constraints and corruption, all of which leads to backlogs, access issues, a lack of documentation, arrest, detention and the risk of refoulement. In 2009, the number of asylum applications in South Africa peaked at 223,324 new applications. However, in 2017, this decreased to just 24,174 applications. While the number of asylum applications have significantly decreased over the past few years, we are seeing many asylum seekers spending a long time in the asylum system waiting for an outcome on their applications. Prior to the implementation of the Refugees Amendment Act in 2020, the time frame for the processing of an asylum application was 180 days. Although this was never um, adhere to, the 180 day period has now been removed from the Refugee Amendment Act and therefore no time period exists for the determination of asylum claims. The reality is that many asylum seekers spend many years in the asylum system waiting for an outcome in their for their applications. Some people have waited for more than 15 years for refugee determination. Once an application for asylum has been lodged, a refugee status determination officer either um, undergoes an interview with the individual and then either confirms whether that person is a refugee or rejects them and provides reasons for that rejection. Rejected applications can be categorized as unfounded, in which case they can be appealed to the Refugee Appeals Authority of South Africa. In other cases, applications are rejected as manifestly unfounded, in which case their applications for asylum are automatically reviewed by the Standing Committee for Refugee Affairs. The poor quality of decision-making at the refugee status determination level leads to many applications being rejected. Many decisions are thereafter either sent back to the refugee status determination officer because of interpretation issues, lack of country of origin information, or misapplication of the law. And what this does is it pushes people into either the appeal or the review processes, leaving them in legal limbo for many years while they wait for an outcome from the standing committee or the Refugee Appeals Authority. Home Affairs statistics for 2017 reflects that a reported number of 27,980 asylum applications were lodged. In the same year, 25,713 RSDO rejections were issued. This means that 25,713 cases were either referred to the Standing Committee for Refugee Affairs or the Refugee Appeals Authority of South Africa. Only 479 individual uh, claims were granted refugee status. In February 2020, the Auditor General released a follow-up performance report. The Standing Committee experienced backlogs of 40,326 cases, and the Refugee Appeals Authority experienced backlogs of 147,794. Both the Standing Committee and the Appeals Authority currently only have three members.
With the current capacity, the Standing Committee would take just over one year to clear its backlog, and the Refugee Appeals Authority would take 68 years to clear its backlog without taking any new cases. All of this leads to asylum seekers remaining within the system for several years for the outcome of their applications, which is why we are seeing application periods taking up to 15 or more years. If we look a little bit more closely at what some of the challenges are to the asylum system, we have identified that there are serious backlogs. Ways in which we can address these backlogs is skills development at the RSDO level. Not only is it important that RSDOs are adequately trained to address issues of backlogs, but defective decision-making amounts to constructive refoulement, and it exposes asylum seekers to deportation and to countries where their lives will be at risk. We can improve capacity at the Standing Committee and the Refugee Appeals Authority to ensure that there are more than three members addressing these backlogs. We then have access issues. In addition to the backlogs, asylum seekers have experienced great difficulty in accessing the refugee reception offices. Due to long queues, asylum seekers are often required to return to a refugee reception office several times before they are able to actually access the offices. This is due to long queue, due to staff capacity constraints and corruption. In situations where asylum seekers are almost exclusively self-supporting without the assistance of government or international community, they sacrifice vulnerable time and money and risk, risk jeopardizing their employment and have to travel with small children who are their dependents under their asylum applications in order to return to the refugee reception offices. Asylum, asylum visas are only valid for a period of three or six months at a time. So throughout the 15 years that an application for asylum is pending, an asylum seeker will have to return to renew their document every three or six months. Under the Refugee Amendment Act, new sections have been implemented, which states that if an asylum seeker fails to renew their documentation within 30 days of, an ex of its expiry, their application is deemed to be abandoned. And what we have seen is in many experiences, asylum seekers have struggled to renew their documentation due to no fault of their own, but due to access issues, due to corruption and capacity constraints. There is also the appointment slip system, which has recently been introduced. We have seen clients receive appointments for a year in advance. Due to capacity constraints at the refugee reception offices, there are not enough officials to determine or to process applications. And what we see is that asylum seekers are given, are given an appointment slip to return for a future date to lodge an application. And in some instances, this future date is for a year's time. We also have a telephone based interpretation system. While this was a good initiative aimed at rooting out corruption, there are serious capacity constraints within this telephone based system and often people have to wait an entire day or are told to return multiple times due to the unavailability of interpreters. As I indicated further, there have also been RRO closures. The urban RROs closed, as well as the Port Elizabeth and Cape Town RROs, which have also been impacted by closure and is currently subject to ongoing litigation. When a refugee reception office closes, it closes. It forces an asylum seeker to take regular journeys to extend their asylum seeker permit in a different location, which can often be in a different province. The asylum system as it stands forces people into a situation where they are unable to regularize their documentation through the denial of access altogether or systemic inefficiencies and barriers throughout the system. I'm going to focus a little bit now on the Refugee Amendment Act, following um, just a brief overview of some of the systemic issues within the application system. The Refugee Amendment Act was, came in, uh, was published the regulations were published on the 27th of December 2019, resulting in the Amendment Act coming into effect in the beginning of January of last year. 
acts or long queues, but rather put into place a number of procedural, administrative and logistical hurdles that complicate refugees and asylum seekers tenuous status and sustainability in the country. These amendments are likely to compound these existing issues which we have just looked at. Our overall concerns with the Amendment Act center around the new exclusions from protection and the extra procedures for officials that are unrelated to refugee protection. The removal of the automatic right to work, the restriction around exclusion and refugee status are of particular concern. And we do not see the Amendment Act having a positive impact on refugee protection. I'm gonna focus on a couple of um, very problematic sections. As I indicated, they introduce a number of procedural requirements which do not aid in refugee protection, and this can be described as a paper wall to keep refugees out. There is a requirement that an application now needs to be lodged within five days of an individual entering the country or they risk being excluded. This is contrary to international refugee law. We have the expanded grounds of exclusion to exclude people from refugee protection. For example, this is if someone doesn't apply within five days, they don't have an asylum transit visa, or if they are a fugitive from justice in a country where the rule of law is upheld. And again, that is very broad and undefined. The expanded grounds of cessation. This includes if a refugee is politically active in South Africa. Again, political activity is undefined and in South Africa is a constitutional right. Now an individual can be excluded or their refugee status can be taken away if they are politically active. I spoke about the abandonment provision. That is if an asylum seeker fails to renew their permit within 30 days, their application is deemed to be abandoned. And this abandonment will render the individual undocumented and at risk of refoulement. This assessment is purely based on a procedural element rather than the substantive merit of an individual's claim for asylum. The automatic removal of the right to work and study means that asylum seekers are no longer permitted to automatically work or to study. They will have to apply through this right through the Standing Committee for Refugee Affairs, which we have already seen has severe backlog issues and only three members. Applications for permanent residence has, has changed from five continuous years of being a recognized refugee to 10. So if an individual is recognized as a refugee after 15 years of being an asylum seeker, they will have to wait another 10 years to be regarded as a permanent resident. I mentioned that the 180 days to process an asylum claim has been removed, removing accountability mechanisms. We do not foresee the Amendment Act having a positive impact on efficiency of refugee protection, and it is shrinking the space for asylum. There are concerns with the, the arguments that the Department of Home Affairs has presented for its justifications on the restriction of refugee protection. Focusing a little bit as I wrap up on COVID-19, the refugee reception offices have remained closed since the lockdown in South Africa took effect on the 27th of March. Some RROs already closed um, their doors mid-March, resulting in no asylum seekers or refugees being able to renew their documentation make submissions to the standing committee or to the Refugee Appeals Authority. And no newcomer has been permitted or able to lodge an application for asylum. On the 23rd of July of last year, the Department of Home Affairs announced an intention to extend the validity of asylum and refugee documentation until the 31st of October, if this documentation expired during the course of the lockdown. This time frame has recently been extended to the 31st of March, 2021. It remains unclear when the refugee reception offices will reopen. Although we welcome the extension of permits, this does pose an incredibly incredible threats to asylum and refugee protection in South Africa. The, the extension does not um, extend to asylum seekers and refugees whose permits expired before the 15th of March and were unable to get to the RROs before they closed. And even where asylum seekers have benefited from the extension, they now face the danger of having to rush to the refugee reception offices when they reopen to um, renew their permits before the 30-day deadline. 
Notwithstanding the extension of permits by the department, we are still seeing many people suffering from difficulty in accessing their bank accounts, access to services such as education, healthcare, healthcare related to COVID-19 specifically, access to UIF, job security, and arrest and detention. It is clear that certain service providers, including state service providers, are not recognizing the automatic extension of rights. What does this mean for asylum seekers and asylum protection in South Africa? When a person applies for asylum in South Africa and becomes an asylum seeker, they enter a period of uncertainty and do not know whether they will be granted refugee status or may eventually have to leave the country, even if that is only that is after 15 or more years. In addition, it is unknown how long the process will take. Therefore, the person might find themselves in prolonged periods of waiting in legal limbo, which can immobilize an individual with their coping mechanisms. Urgent changes in the implementation of South Africa's legislation and policies towards asylum seekers and refugees is required in order to comply with international law and as well as to achieve the rights in our constitution. This will also reduce post-migration problems and provide support for long-term asylum seekers and refugees in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jessica, for that um, pertinent reflection and really um, giving us a very you know, holistic overview, in a sense, of the South African um, situation. And I'm now pleased to indicate that the floor is now open for questions. And um, you may kindly indicate uh, by show of hands if you'd like to ask a question specifically to one of our panelists. Uh, please, when you ask a question, um, do kindly state your name, your organization, and whom you'd like to address your question to. Um, and please do keep your questions concise so as to allow, allow our panelists um, get the crux of your question and give you a um, specific answer. Please, when you ask your question, um, I kindly also like to ask you to show your video if possible, and of course, unmute your mic. Um, in the meantime, I do see that um, there are two questions that have been posted on the chat box. Um, one is from uh, Vasily Sofia Delis, and his question is whether we have considered using social tech entrepreneurship and digital skills as a tool for integration, bringing locals and refugees and migrants together. Also, there's a question from um, Abdel Fatah Ezin, and I suppose the, the crux of your question is um, how we can protect women and children who are recruited by militias within the context of armed conflict. So perhaps reflecting on the protection, on protection within the context of armed conflict. Um, I'd like to kindly ask our panelists to probably take turns at that. But if you have specific questions, please do kindly indicate by raising up your hand. So I think we'll go first. Um, if you'd like to respond to the question, um, Pedro, or if you'd want to respond, Jessica. Okay, I do see that Abdel Fateh, you have your hands raised. So I'd just like to call on you. Kindly unmute your mic and show your video as you ask your question. Thank you. Abdel Fattah, you can unmute your mic. Bonjour. Alors, là, je suis Abdelazin du Maroc. Je suis responsable du réseau africain migration développement, qui est porté par notre association Espace Médiation. Alors, la question que je pose, essentiellement aux panélistes. C'est euh, concernant euh, les réfugiés et comment ne pas rester dans des expériences d'État africain. Aujourd'hui, on est dans la ZLEC, c'est-à-dire la zone de libre circulation, de libre commerce, des de, 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 de richesses. Alors, comme nous demandons une libre circulation en Afrique, euh, comment, dans le cadre de l'agenda africain pour l'immigration qui a été proposé par le Maroc et adopté par euh, l'Union africaine et on salue aussi la mise en place de l'Observatoire africain des migrations. Alors, comment mettre en place une politique, disons, concernant unifiée africaine, concernant les réfugiés et surtout, surtout la question des femmes et bien sûr qui, qui sont victimes de traite et la question des enfants qui sont enrôlés dans des actions militarisées. Merci. 
je vous remercie infiniment pour votre um, excellent uh, question. And I do know that our, our panelists um, might have also um, gotten the question, but just in case um, you've not been able to use the interpretation, um, he asked that how do we, how can we adopt a common African uh, position that, that focuses on refugees? So really reflecting on the regional landscape and, and sort of coming up with a comprehensive strategy in that context. And then how do we also include women who are victims of women trafficking um, in, in within this context. So please, if you'd like to um, answer the question, I think we'd probably just start off with um, Jessica and then we could move to Dr. Pedro, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, I can answer the second question um, specifically, or the first question, uh, specifically in the South African context. In terms of our refugee law, our refugee protection, it, in, it includes uh, a very similar to, or identical to, to both UN conventions, where if someone is a member of a particular social group that includes gender, they, depending on their circumstances, can apply for refugee protection in South Africa. So a member of a particular social group would include a woman um, based on their gender who have experienced sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you very much for your response, um, Dr. Pedro. I, well, I, I will try to answer not only um, Ambilatif, is, am I pronouncing the correctly? Um, and also Vasilis, you know, trying to answer both. In terms, and I'll probably start with Vasili. I think this idea, like the, the specific area where I work, North Zambia, Northwestern province is, uh, and namely lately as the so-called new copper belt is, um, well, we don't know if the new copper belt actually is this, this is the first, the, the first point, but, but it ha has been attracted many, many migrants. And what I see is actually uh, a very interesting relationship. It's not, and even, even with regard to to, to refugees, it's not, there's not hostility, I'd say. I mean, of course there are cases of hostility towards migrants and, and refugees, but they are um, residual in the sense that it's not, it, it's very common to hear people being very welcome either towards refugees and towards migrants. I, I think this will change in, uh, or it's already changing is the new copper belt this is not providing and companies are not providing the sort of uh, social contributions and, and their social responsibility is not what they it was once and and so employment begins to to be an issue and i don't know how this uh, and in terms of this uh, of keeping this welcoming uh, approach to to foreign people coming, be them migrants or, or refugees. And, um, and so trying to understand this idea of entrepreneurship and digital skills, um, I see like, and I can only speak about the, the case study because as I started with my, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, I like to stick to what I actually collect uh, from 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 the ground, and um, and namely with regard to Congolese displaced, uh, which are mainly urban. Of course, there are also Congolese coming from more rural regions, but there are many 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 refugees from Congo coming from from cities, and they are and have been in contact with or more close contact with the technologies. And, and, and you see a lot of opportunities uh, emerging in terms of small studios, in terms, not only in this camp, but also around in the, um, in Solwezi, which is the nearest town. Um, so it exists and, and local people actually look for it. So I, I'd say that it's quite, well, Harmonious, so to say, it's, it's symbiotic. The relationship between all these, all these, uh, these different peoples. Concerning the um, a common, the existence of a common framework in an African Union passport, I'd say, in in principle, I think it's an interesting 
an interesting proposal. Although, then again, I'd say that Africa is extremely diverse, and um, and and the needs, the regional needs, are are not exactly the same. So. I'd say that as a point of departure, it might be an interesting and, and common framework, but in the in the long run, uh, we will realize that there are we need we'll need to fine tune according to to the regions. And then again, if we're talking about Angola and Zambia and even Congo, the northwestern province, um, and Angola Mushikos, the the proximity is is such that this this would be even i mean this would create more issues i'd say than the than those that already exist in the sense that people already move more or less freely and and this legislation and one of the the points of my of my presentation that we could also discuss it's and, and of course it's a big issue but it's the that borders and most legal frameworks in the in many contexts, actually at the beginning are extremely useful and important to protect displaced populations, but in the long run, they actually hinder um, in the, the integration of these populations. It's, it's, it might seem paradoxical, but this is my, this is my experience, or this is what I, what I can say about it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Petro, um, for that um, excellent summation and, and many thanks to, to um, Ms. Jessica. I do see that there is a hand. Um, Mr. Abraham, do you want to ask a question? Kindly unmute your mic, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, the organizers of this uh, conference, which has been very uh, informative. I'm um, a PhD law student at Durham University in the UK. And uh, my area of research is uh, international human rights with uh, a focus on uh, legal protection of asylum seekers and uh, migrants. Uh, from the presentations uh, uh, this morning, especially in the first session, it seems that uh, uh, in Africa or in the African context, uh, people uh, who I will regard as uh, economic migrants and uh, also those uh, on forced uh, uh, displacement uh, are all together uh, intertwined with those who faces uh, uh, persecution. Uh, in reference to the uh, refugee convention. So my uh, worry is uh, if uh, that is the way it is in Africa, very different uh, from uh, the situation in Europe, and wouldn't you think uh, that that will uh, uh, bring a body on uh, the UNCHR even the receiving states and uh, refugee agencies, because um, just lumping them all together as refugees might be uh, a problem in uh, knowing exactly who faces persecution if we have to take it alongside the refugee uh, uh, convention. So I don't know if there's anyone who wants to um, look at it from that uh, perspective. Thank you very much for your question. Um, do we have one of our panelists wanting to respond to it? Perhaps we would um, would go with um, Miss Jessica. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood the question. Um, is it regarding protection of those facing persecution beyond the two conventions, so the UN convention? Yeah, what I mean from what I gathered from the uh, presentation is same that even people who are economic migrants who are in search of better uh, uh, living standards and those who are 
of uh, forced uh, migration uh, for reasons of uh, uh, climate or wars or any other uh, issues not relating to persecution by the states or their own uh, national governments are also being uh, uh, given that as refugee uh, 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 status. So that is what I'm saying. How do you, if, if that is the situation, then I'm afraid that might be too much for the uh, UAHCR and even the receiving state, because if a particular set of people had to move from one country or the other for economic reasons, and they have to be received by the uh, by this country they have moved to, then that might be a problem for that country and for refugee agencies, which the refugee convention is not really about the refugee convention to my understanding is uh, specifically for people who are persecuted on account of the convention reasons. So that is, I, I thought there should be a, a dichotomy between economic migrants as we have here in, the, in Europe and uh, those who are actually being persecuted or uh, who faces persecution. Okay, yeah, um, in terms of South Africa's refugee protection, an economic migrant would not qualify for refugee protection. And if someone is here for reasons not related to war or to persecution, and they are here for economic reasons or to pursue studies, they would have to apply for a permit in terms of our Immigration Act. And there are permits for businesses, for education, study permits, or work permits. So they wouldn't qualify. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your response. And I do see that there's another question by uh, Mr. Didier Okitahata, and in, he asked in French uh, that with all these imperfections mentioned in the South African legislation, surely um, it, this might have unfortunate consequences for asylum seekers. Are there lobbying for changes in place? I think there's a yes, question. Yes, so this does have. Oh, sorry, I just went ahead. Um, okay. This does have serious implications for refugee protection in South Africa. Um, a number of the provisions in the Refugee Amendment Act on the face of it are contrary to international refugee law as well as our constitution. The consultation process um, prior to the implementation of the Refugee Amendment Act was poor and many different organizations, civil society, as well as community-based organizations made substantive comments on the draft amendment act. But it is clear that very little of these submissions were taken in con into consideration uh, with the publishing of the final act. Unfortunately, at this point, there's very little that we can do um, other than to engage with the Department of Home Affairs or to engage in litigation to challenge these various sections of the Refugee Amendment Act. It is clear that these sections um, will be implemented and in some cases some of them have already been implemented and there is a um, sorry to challenge various sections which are deemed unconstitutional. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jessica, and, and thank you to everyone who did ask a question, and many thanks as well to Dr. Pedro. I do see that uh, Ms. Elizabeth had had to um, leave us for now, but I, I would like to really thank all our speakers, but more importantly, thank you as well for participating in this um, pertinent uh, conference. Um, and just to indicate that we would have this, um, the, the, as this session was being recorded, if you'd like to go back to it later and watch it, you are kindly invited to do so, to be available on the Center for Human Rights platform. Um, and on this note, I would like to thank everyone for um, coming around, but then more importantly, also our presenters uh, as speakers, and also uh, those that have asked questions, our um, interpreters as well for their very kind patience. Um, and thank you to 
uh, to the Center for Human Rights team as well on, uh, on our parts, Ms. Tiruna, um, Ms. Yolanda for really leading the, the team and uh, Ms. Tiruna as well for uh, significantly assisting with, it, with this process. Um, please do kindly note that if you'd like to get across to any of our presenters, um, we would please just kindly get across to us and we'll be sure to um, share their contacts with you and the information. But thank you very much for your very kind participation. And we do hope that you have a lovely um, evening ahead and um, and also enjoy the rest of the conference um, as well, um, given the fact that it's around, it's really also reflected on other regions and how the um, our refugee protection is being advanced within the context of the UNHCR's uh, pertinent um, mandate. So thank you very much for my end and do have a lovely evening. <laughs>